everybody. Welcome back to the Noel Castler Podcast, episode 96. Coming to you from the other side of the living room. Had to sit down at the piano today. And uh, you guys never seen this area. I might as well give you a show. A lot of instruments, a lot of guitar amps, keyboards, and uh, got a brand new keyboard here that just got delivered because this is what my friend Jeff Young used to play when he toured with Jackson Brown. It's the same model. And sadly, my friend Jeff Young passed away um, the other day on Thursday. I got the awful news, and uh, Jeff was a remarkable soul, an incredible musician, an even better person. And this guy was a legend as a musician. He played with Don Fagan, he played with Sting, he played with Jackson Brown and his band for decades. He brought warmth and a beautiful singing voice. He sort of had that sandpaper, Al Green, almost a Sam Cooke. You know, he had a like a falsetto, but it was smooth, but smooth like a cat's tongue, you know, <laughs> like in a good way. And a uh, remarkable musician came out of the New York scene, grew up in Mount Vernon, was beloved by studio cats and, and you know, that sort of first call you know, backing band, house musician kind of guys. He was a musician's musician, played the B3 and the piano, and uh, just a wonderful guy with a beautiful family, um, two remarkable sons and a, and a loving wife, Susanna and Nico and Skyler are his children, and, and these are beautiful children, and anybody who lived in Santa Monica knew this family probably, because they would have these events in their backyards full of music and light and, uh, inclusiveness and, and Jeff was the kind of guy who I could go years without seeing him and, and you wouldn't miss a beat and he'd be like what are you doing how are you you know what's the latest with your projects he was somebody who was always encouraging of other people's endeavors and, and the last time I saw him and his beautiful wife they were sort of very happy for me because I seemed to be in a good place you know I'd been doing comedy it's going well and you know I, I was a lot lighter noticeably healthier <laughs> than when I was sort of behind the scenes and and they remarked upon that and I remember seeing their smiling faces and I remember saying to him like well hey you know you can't sorry you can't be miserable forever you know everybody's got to let go of their darkness sometimes you know as the song goes and uh they sort of seemed to vibe in on that and were happy for me so I was beyond saddened to hear that news on Thursday and um, you know the world lost an incredible spirit and we've been experiencing a lot of that these days but I wanted to open the show with some piano and uh, I appreciate you indulging me and beyond that you know I'm where everybody else is at I'm, I'm sending thoughts and prayers to California <laughs> I know you guys got hammered this climate change is real the fact that it snowed you know, right outside of L.A. in the mountains, I was on Stephanie Miller's show this morning, and she said, you know, in the mountains, they got like five feet of snow. They got four inches of rain in L.A. and Santa Monica and stuff. So I know it's been no picnic. It's freezing. And, you know, it's real. It's scary. And it should be almost what everybody gets up and thinks about and talks about every day, right? Climate change is on us to the point that it should be sort of like priority number one. Even the political stuff, which obviously we can't ignore and it ties together, even that eventually is going to take a back seat to what climate change is bringing our way, right? Because when the mountain is sliding down on your house, you don't care, you know, who you're voting for inside the house. You know, you're just trying to survive and, and we're, we're at the existential threat level now you know we're we're, we're we're beyond where all the the even the most sort of like doom doom and gloom oriented scientists you know the ones that were nobody was exaggerating but the ones that were most sort of exuberant in their predictions we've gone beyond their model models meaning like the worst case scenario we've already passed that point in terms of glaciers melting and all this kind of stuff and it's real, and it's a real threat, and it's affecting our lives, it's affecting our livelihoods. And, you know, like in the Northeast, we haven't gotten any snow. We're supposed to get that snow tonight that that, uh, that L.A. got over the weekend. And I, I drove up last week to Massachusetts, I was talking about, and, and passed, like the first place I ever went skiing, Catamount, which is on the border of Massachusetts and New York State. 
and it looked like a golf course like the parking lot was all mud there was no snow beneath the trees you know between the trees and it was like that all over new england it was like that in vermont this year new hampshire maine so when when it doesn't when the weather doesn't behave the way it's supposed to people don't make the money they're supposed to right the industries that were once supported don't get a chance to have a season <laughs> and, and i worked in the ski industry when i was a young man uh, you know i moved to vale when i was 18 and would spend winters out there. That's when I was working on Capitol Hill as a bike courier. You know, I was a big ski bum in high school. I was the ski tech for Westchester Ski Tours. And it was my job every weekend to go to a ski resort in the Northeast and I'd be like the guy fixing your rental skis. And we would take like all the area school skiing. It was, you know, it was Westchester County where I am now. It was a, you know, it was a way to affordably go skiing if you were a middle class high school kid. And, and, and you didn't have to be middle class. And, you know, we'd, we'd take schools from the city. It wasn't, it, the, the idea was that skiing didn't have to just be an elitist kind of thing. You could go on an affordable ski vacation. And I was the ski tech and I loved it. And I loved skiing because it was a very sort of, you could, first of all, you could do it by yourself. I wasn't big into team sports because I didn't want to get tackled. <laughs> like I'm not that big, you know what I mean? So it was a fun, like athletic thing to do and you didn't have to worry about, you know, somebody twice your size, like trying to murder you. Uh, so that was an appeal, though I did play lacrosse and stuff. And I just say it's a healthy activity. It helped me build self-esteem coming out of what some of the stuff I came out of in my childhood. You know, it's, I love being in the mountains and being in nature. So, and I'm 52 next month, right? In a few weeks. So like to, to have that thing where it was a certainty that you could go skiing you know, in the winter in, in New York, right? Uh, I'm 20 minutes from a, a, a lift area, a ski area now, you know, that, you know, they make their own snow. But when I was in high school, I could, I could go skiing within an hour, hour and a half drive, you know, and, and all the way up into Canada and, and, and hit slopes that were decent, right? It was icy. It wasn't powder like in Colorado, but you could do the sport, right? And a lot of people did. It was a team sport. You know, people had ski teams in high schools. To have that all gone in my relatively short sort of lifetime, to have it change at the level it's changed because of no other reason than global warming is, is beyond remarkable. It, it's terrifying. And, and it's weird that even one life would contain that kind of change. And you could look across a myriad of, of, of things in the natural world and, and make that claim, right? Other people could make that claim about, you know, the Great Barrier Reef. And, and that being bleached over their lifetime or, you know, the sea levels rising and, and land that was, you know, once dry land is now wetland, all kinds of stuff. And it's all a result of the same thing, you know, of, of the petrochemical industry and our reliance on fossil fuels. And, and it's, it's our reliance on consumerism and sort of <clears throat> not living in accordance with the natural world right? Letting the laws of capitalism sort of dictate how we do everything, even if it's obviously a bad idea. You know, we just think, well, we'll make as many cars as we can sell and we'll have a gazillion cars on the planet or we'll have a gazillion clothes, as I was talking about recently. You know, fast fashion is one of the worst things you can do now. You know, like for the environment, this is not a sponsorship, by the way. This is just a beer mug I got at a wedding. But, uh, <laughs> for those watching fast fashion is like you know wrecking parts of africa because there's so much clothes and in parts of india they're dumping all this stuff right they're just sending it to other countries and like it's your problem and it makes people feel better you drop that stuff in a bin or you drop it off at a you know at a you know, thrift store or something, and you think you're doing the right thing. And for all of our lives, that was doing the right thing, right? It was like letting something else be recycled and reused, and you'd feel better about going out and replacing it with new stuff. Now that you have all these companies, and I shop at Uniqlo, like I, I, I'm as guilty as anybody else, making all this fashion that's easily accessible, it's always on sale online, right? There's always too much of it, so you're always getting a deal you can't resist. That's, you know, that stuff is, it's, it's using child labor to make it, right? Less than 4% of the garment workers in the world make a livable wage. So there's already exploitation in the creation of the product, but then the end result, the lifespan of the product, odds are it's gonna end up polluting the planet 
as a, as a substance, you know, as, a, as something that's too much that's going to get dumped on a place that doesn't have much say in the matter. There's also a lot of chemicals in the manufacturing and stuff. So that's just one industry I'm using as an example, but it's part of this thing that we're caught up in now with this just consumption and just the online, you know, you can press a button and something gets delivered to your door. You know, I, I ordered literally this keyboard on Friday morning <clears throat> when I woke up thinking about Jeff because it was in a picture with him. I was like, what was that keyboard Jeff used? And I saw it in a picture and I ordered it and it was delivered to my house <laughs> on Sunday from Indiana. Like, that's crazy, right? You know, and there's, some of that is convenient, but some of that is like, it, it almost should be harder. You know, it, it, we should buy goods that are already shipped to our area. It shouldn't just be like press a button and get anything in the world because that stuff doesn't go anywhere and it puts an extra car on the road, you know, and I didn't want it delivered on a Sunday necessarily, right? I didn't need another big FedEx truck going down my country road on a day where everybody deserves a break. But I'm sort of digressing there, but you get my point, you know, this this global consumerism thing. The winners of this are at the top of the food chain, right? Your Jeff Bezos, right? Your Elon Musk, your, your, your big industrialists, your Koch brothers. All of these guys are benefiting from mass consumerism, right? Even though the, you know, the one percenters are amassing fortunes that the rest of the world will never catch up with, you can feel rich, you can participate in this consumerism right? And it can keep you like a hamster on the wheel of continuing to sort of participate in your own destruction. And, and that's what we're doing with the environment. And I'm not trying to be heavy on people. I'm just talking about it. We all do it, right? We, we, Carter is, is, is in his final days, apparently, or, or weeks, or however long we were blessed to have him still on the planet. We were talking about it last time. He was a conservation guy, right? Put on a sweater and turn down the thermostat. That's the kind of thing we need to do now in life. You know, that's a good metaphor for all the ways you can help conserve your energy just because you can spend it, just because you can buy it, just because you can consume it or use it doesn't mean you have to because there's finite resources of this old way of doing business, which is clearly benefiting the few and hurting the many, right? New technology, solar power, you know, quality goods that are made in a sustainable way that you buy a sweater that lasts you 20 years instead of 20 sweaters in 10 years, you know, like that sort of mentality will pay dividends and it will enrich all of us because because products should tell a story, right? You should buy a sweater that if you can, that was handmade, that was woven, that represented a culture or something. I'm using that as an example, but stores, you know, stores and clothes can be like, wonderful things, right? I, I, I go to Massachusetts because there's, you know, Great Barrington, Mass has all these like, I don't want to say mom and pop shops, but sort of like hip stores that are, that's that single store, you know, that's a brick and, brick and mortar representation of what that person is going out and, and getting in the world and curating and trying to sell it to me, you know, or Katona, New York, there's a, you know, a, I go to those places to buy clothes because I want to buy it from somebody who's into what they're selling, who knows what they're selling and has researched the products, right? I don't, I try to try to stay out of the big box stuff. But my point is we can learn a lot from each other by, by, by changing our habits as consumers, by buying things that have more valuable value that are sort of like heirloom quality. And uh, it doesn't mean <clears throat> folks should go without or you have to be super wealthy or anything to participate in that because you don't, you know, and the good news is if you're into vintage fashion or just getting clothes on the cheap, <clears throat> thrift stores are full of it now and you're doing everybody a favor by reusing and recycling stuff and uh, shopping secondhand. So that's a weird tangent to be on, but my point is it's all related and every day in our lives we can wake up and be like, how am I going to make a difference today, you know? Because it gets overwhelming, right? It gets completely, you know, what am I even going to do? I just want to distract myself. But you can't really distract yourself. You can kid yourself. You can put yourself to sleep. But when you wake up in the morning, it's going to be twice as bad, right? It's always going to be there until you start participating in the solution, which is awareness, right? It's, it's being like, hey, I'm here for a reason. 
right? And I got the strength to confront this. I'm not in this alone. We're all facing this. Whether you're in denial of climate change or you're out there every day doing your part to save the planet, we're all in the same boat. Some are just arguing over, you know, the semantics because they want to keep going down the river that's leading us into catastrophe and some people want to save us. And, it, and it's always sort of been that way. And, and you see it in the Republicans so easily because it's so calcified, right? Everything's binary with them. Biden bad, Trump good. And, and they'll take any situation and they'll see, superimpose that reactionary dogma on it. Like you look at what happened in East Palestine, Ohio, they're like, this is Biden's fault. He's over in Ukraine when he should have been here. Meanwhile, we all know Trump relaxed, you know, not relaxed, repealed the Obama era legislation and, and sort of, you know, I don't know what the best nomenclature to say it, but the regulations that were going to update the braking systems on, on railways, on trains, to give them faster brakes, right? Because it would take like three miles or whatever the figure is to slow one of these things down. And that's insane when you're carrying radioactive waste, which essentially is what all of those trains are carrying. Right? All those freight trains are full of chemicals. That's what they use, the gnarliest stuff in the world. Right, Your flat screen is coming in a truck on the highway. You know, the, 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 the home heating oil and all this other, not home heating oil, that, that comes through pipelines, but petrochemicals, the stuff that they make out of all that crude oil, the really gnarly, nasty stuff, that gets shipped around by trains because it's a different regulatory system. And and it's part of the fabric of the country, right? The stuff that's spilled in East Palestine, that's what they make plastic out of. Every hard plastic thing you buy is, is, is coming out of those kind of like polymers and, and you know, vinyl, polyvinyl chloride. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not breaking bad, dude. Like, <laughs> but you know, that, that stuff is, is part of our lives and it's part of this vast commercial network, right? And this global sort of consumer society. And that's what's pumping this poison into our communities, right? It's this endless cycle of I buy something, well, somebody's got to make that thing you bought and just threw out and just bought another new one. And guess what? They're both made out of this black plastic crap that's the same thing that that chemical that spilled all over Ohio was carrying that was that that was the base chemical that they make all this crap out of you know so you have to think about it you have to think am i part of that catastrophe or am i gonna like stop and be like wait a minute like why are we buying all this crap you know like this keyboard i bought it's made out of metal you know it's made out of aluminum which isn't that much better but it's not cheap plastic and i spent a little more and went out of my way to find it and the keys are wood you know and, and good old-fashioned ivory you know i prefer ivory pure ivory <laughs> that's a joke okay that's a joke ivory was always the horrific choice okay <laughs> but my point is it's a quality thing that's built to last and it cost me a little extra money but it wasn't as much a part of kind of the destruction of the planet as single-use plastics and low-quality plastic stuff is. You know, speaking of Jackson Brown, when Jeff and I toured together, Jeff Young, mighty Jeff Young, the first leg of the tour we did in 2010 was in Europe. So we were over in Europe, J uh, Jackson had David Lindley and all these, you know, great band with him. And I was the band's road manager, okay? And this was my first, I'd known Jackson for a long time, but this was my first time working as a road manager with a band. And these were, these were guys that I'd been seeing play for 20 years before I got this job. So I was in awe of these guys as musicians, and I find out I'm going to be their road manager, and I get put on the bus with them. So I leave my apartment in New York, I fly into... London, you know, and the production manager kind of already hates me, you know, <laughs> he's like a rough kind of dude from Santa Cruz who doesn't get the like New York TV guy, you know, thinks I don't deserve the opportunity I got and I had to prove myself to him, which I later did, but my point is rock and roll can be a little rougher on the surface than the corporate sort of TV network world that I was kind of coming out of where you don't get to be as, you know anti-woke sort of shall we put it that's a stupid term but you know what i mean it's the corporate shit was was hip you know in tv and entertainment way before like rock and roll like that's the last air like 
you know, the last bastion of sort of misogynistic kind of just, you know, you know, it's roadies. You, you can probably fill in the blanks. But so this band's all gentlemen, right? So they're great guys. The production crew, you know, it was a great crew. I just had this hard ass guy. So I'm nervous and I'm kind of like, how is this going to work out? You know, and there's a whole bunch of responsibilities that are completely new to me and you have to do it all within the day. So until you get into your routine, you're just like running around trying to keep up. And uh, I would get nervous around these dudes, you know, and and because you'd work this whole day and then you'd get after show food and you'd put it on the bus and you'd, you know, drive to Scotland or wherever was next. And Jeff was the first guy I bonded with because he was from New York and we sat up late at night on the tour bus and he loved Broadway and the theater. And so we had all this stuff in common. And I worked on the NBA All-Star game for a long time. He was a basketball fan and, you know, we knew a bunch of people in common. So he was the first guy I sort of bonded with and, and, you know, melted the ice. And then I bonded with the rest of the guys. And it was like a band of older brothers, you know, that were taking me across Europe and showing me the ropes. And then later that summer, we toured the U.S., you know, a big tour where we, I remember picking Jeff and his family up outside of Jackson Studio Groove Masters in Santa Monica. And they they all piled on the bus, you know, for a ride to, to gig up at the Greek or something. And, uh, and then we were off. But that summer, Jackson and his, his wife, girlfriend, had, had sort of started this plastic pollution coalition thing. They'd gone into a partnership with somebody who, who, who started a, a campaign to stop using single-use plastics, which I'm very much in favor of. And this is before that that stuff was getting talked about every day. Like Jackson was one of the first tours to not use plastic bottles because you'll get 200 bottles, you know, on a production rider, they'll put you, you'll put, you know, 12 cases of bottled water on the back, you know, the back on the loading dock for the crew to drink all day. And we were like, why are we doing this? So we gave everybody in the crew sing, you know, aluminum water bottles and we brought our own air, you know, purifiers. I mean, water purifiers, like water, jugs like you have in an office like the tank with the big jug in it we brought those things on the truck with the band gear and set them up and everybody would walk to that and get filtered water that we brought in ourselves and cleaned ourselves. you know that was just the beginning <laughs> and jackson was doing that shit sorry to curse before anybody so this tour they were like all right we got noel here as a road manager he can probably pull this off so the idea was to not use any single-use plastics in the after show food and I, I talked about this with jimmy once on the show you know you finish a concert you're getting takeout for the band and the crew and the artist you're talking you know 30 people right on average so 35 40 people will get like sh food after you're done loading out you know after you get on the tour bus after the gig and and we would get you know good you get like mexican food or something like you try to avoid pizza and get something a little more substantial not that there's anything wrong with pizza but uh pizza's like too easy and uh so you'd get like barbecue or whatever cool thing i would try to always get something local right i'd research it and find a local place that was family owned you know it was a real business that had roots in the community because it's important to spread that kind of money around and that was one of the great pleasures of being a road manager was that I always had a big wad of cash in my pocket that I was allowed to spend <laughs> to, and we were making money, you know, as a tour. So I wanted to put as much of that money locally back into the community when we pulled through town as I possibly could. So I would seek out these places and say, I'm going to get barbecue for 40 people, you know, and I'm going to come pick it up at 1030 tonight, but I don't want it in all these like styrofoam containers or plastic or whatever crap you guys usually use. I want it in these like recyclable, like aluminum kits. So we'd give them these kits out to every crew member as well. But so I would have to buy all this food and, or get the restaurant to put it in these kits and and I did it, but it was a pain in the ass, you know, and Jeff was on that tour with me and these guys were kind of laughing at me because my day off, I'd, I'd have all the empty kits in my hotel room trying to like wash them out in the bathtub and stuff. Like it was too hard to do essentially, you know, and a lot of people are like, hey, we can't put it in your thing. It's the local law. We have to put it in the disposable containers and stuff. So my point being, as, as good as your desires are, you know, as, as much as you want to do the right thing, it has to come from the top down. It has to come from the state and the local and the federal level. 
conservation, right? It, it's not a personal virtue, as Dick Cheney said. It's something that has to be done. And New York's a great example. Like, you know, we banned single-use plastic bags, right? You banned plastic straws or tried to. I don't know if it fully happened, but that kind of thing, you have to mandate it because then everybody can bitch about it, but you'll see that you adapt to it. And when you try to be the odd man out, when you try to be on the vanguard of that kind of stuff, and people have to do that, right? It becomes that much harder and people look at you like you're cross-eyed. And it gets so hard that people give up and they don't bother. And then you end up with barbecue for 40 people and 40 sets of plastic, black plastic knives and forks and all this packaging and all this crap. That's the stuff in the train, you know, in East Palestine. That's what that stuff is. You know, that stuff is made out of oil. It's made out of the stuff that's killing us, you know, and it's everywhere. You know, like, like you guys, I probably, you know, we put out recycling once a week. I'm pretty hip to that stuff and I don't consume a lot of stuff. And I'm shocked at how much waste recyclable paper and plastic and crap that just ends up in the world, you know, just from my little slice of the planet. So we have to, we have to get hip to changing that as a people. And that's why I like Biden, right? Biden reminds me of Carter in that way. Like he's sort of, he's got a, a knack for getting people excited about doing the right thing. And, and that's really what's gonna lead us out of this. It has to become a challenge. As I've said before, we should be trying to outdo each other to see who could be more conservation minded, who can be a better shepherd of the environment, who can protect this planet. Like you wanna talk about toxic masculinity and being a man, do that. Create, you know, protect creatures that are part of creation, that are part of this wonderful planet that have given you all the things that you supposedly value in life, right? You know, protect it so you can pass it on to other generations. Become aware of the energy out there. If you like to hunt and you like to be one of these woodsy guys, understand how many species are in that forest that you're walking into, you know, to chase a deer or something. All these other creatures are there because they're part of an ecosystem. And if that ecosystem goes south, the animals you covet or like to hunt are gone too, right? You lose the bumblebees, you lose it all. You lose produce, you lose pollination, you know, it's, it's we're, we're at a dangerous level. And, and if we shift our attitudes, if we make it a, a competition almost, you know, a, a way to, to engage in these troubles and these, you know, you know, these things that are almost beyond comprehension. So, you know, tendency is to almost be overwhelmed and give up or, or be like, I can't be that woke or that radical or something, you know, but, but it, you know, if it can be presented to you in a way that it can become part of the national effort and the national dialogue, then you can do it. People did remarkable things during World War II, women most especially, right? 19-year-old women left their homes in the Midwest and went to work in shipyards on the coasts, you know, welding, like all day and all night. People were welding underwater, like who'd never been near that stuff before, who'd never left the family farm. We're learning these kick-ass skills and kicking butt in producing you know, all of this stuff to save the world. People got into it. They were rationing, you know, tin cans and aluminum cans and not using more of their share. We need to be in the same mentality now, the same mode, you know, a war footing and not an aggressive, you know, we'll win this by killing the other guy kind of war footing, but uh, we'll win this by coming together and working in concert to preserve what we value as a people and anything in the natural world should fall under our purview, right? It should be presented in a way that it's all interrelated and it's all worthy of our efforts. And those are our higher angels. And you need leaders that can call you towards that you know, towards that kind of compassion and that kind of service. That's how you get things done, right? John F. Kennedy is remembered because that's part of what he called on people to do, right? Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I probably mangled that, but that kind of like appeal, that, that motivated people, <laughs> you know? Young people are like, yeah, I'm gonna join the Peace Corps. I'm gonna get involved in the civil rights movement. I'm gonna look at the world around me and make a difference for the better. And you can sense that spirit in young people now. 
I don't know if anybody saw this remarkable young woman in Florida. I can't think of her name, and I apologize for that, but I just saw the clip the other day. She's one of the three students that are suing DeSantis over removing the AP high school course teaching black history, you know, um, which is American history. It's not a separate alternative history. It is the true story of this country and what you need to be taught to these kids. And she was remarkably well-spoken. She gave this press conference, pretty blonde girl, like very telegenic, so probably their worst nightmare because I think this clip went viral and I think Joe Re Joy Reid put her on and stuff. And uh, and the two other guys were completely, it was a, a young man and a young woman that were, they were all speaking to this issue in such a way that it inspired me because they were like, look, we want to know the truth. We want to make a difference. If we're the generation that is going to be accepting you know, of equality and of each other, and we're going to push out this hate and intolerance, we need to know the real deal, right? We need to know the truth so it doesn't happen again. That's a wise kid right there, you know, or kids. And to see that, you can see that same spirit. You could, you know, guys were eating bananas so they'd make weight to join World War II. Like once, you know, Pearl Harbor happened and, and we started calling on people to show up, they were showing up, <laughs> you know? People were like, all right, let me be a part of this. But because it comes, it becomes a calling and that's what we need to do. And that's what we're in, right? If you're fighting this thing, if you're watching this or listening to this podcast, you already, you already know what I'm saying. You've already been in this resistance or whatever you want to call this. You've already been fighting through something that you probably never thought you would see in your lifetime, right? Trump was beyond the pale of what anybody thought they would see. And, and why I started speaking out and left TV when he ran in, in 2016, because my colleagues didn't want to. And I was like, guys, there's nothing on the other side of this, okay? This guy that we know, if he becomes president, he's going to mess stuff up so bad <laughs> that we're all going to be endangered and they were like well i don't want to not get work you know if i t if i speak out i won't get sag jobs and whatever and you know what happened the entertainment industry got shut down for a year anyway because trump mismanaged the covid pandemic you know and reacted to it politically instead of shutting it down and doing the right thing <laughs> in the beginning he made it exponentially worse because he only saw how he could profit and how jared could profit and his own political fortunes so they were willing to let Blue states hang out to dry, which they did to us in New York and Massachusetts and stuff, you know, and they were willing to kind of like sign up with anti-maskers and anti-vaxxers because it fed into the MAGA movement. So beyond the fact that people would die, they were like, fine, if this helps us get reelected, sure. You know, drink ivermectin or whatever the hell they were doing. So, so it's just frustrating, right? but you've been involved in something, my point is that you probably didn't think you would have to deal with, right? Life was kind of going on normal, <laughs> normally, you know? Life is always going to be life, right? It's never easy and there's always going to be tumult in the world and we were still facing climate change, but we didn't have this massive distraction. And that's a lot of what Trump was, right? Because all that time he wasted, all that energy that he sucks out of our national discourse when we should be talking about climate change, you know, we're spending it reacting to the hand grenades that they're constantly throwing into the mix to just create chaos. And then you have Elon Musk and, you know, Rupert Murdoch and all these other chaos agents making big money off of this situation or trying to take down Twitter on behalf of Putin, which is clearly what Musk was trying to do to sort of help him hide the war crimes of Ukraine. It's the same thing GOP is doing when they're trying to, to pin, you know, Biden caring more about Ukraine than Ohio on him. That's the most cynical, stupid thing, but it's a dumbass talking point that guys will eat up on podcasts, you know, and, and Christian, fascist, whatever you call all these Southerners, you know, and Midwesterners and Northerners. I, I, I don't mean to single out the South anymore. It's spread, right? The South used to be very representation, very, very, you know, obviously represented the most racist part of America for obvious reasons. But sort of Trump made that brand national. MAGA hats and MAGA flags are everywhere, as are Confederate flags, you know. They made ignorance and hatred a lifestyle brand. And the guys behind it saw there was a lot of money in that, you know. <laughs> There's a reason like your right-wing podcasters make millions, you know, and your left-wing guys are, you know, 
like me. <laughs> but my point being, there's big money in keeping the status quo the way it is, in distracting you, in making you feel overwhelmed or angry, you know, instead of participating in what will save you, you know. And, and you have to always be aware of these issues and you have to always look towards leadership that is pointing towards the big picture and the uncomfortable truths. And, you know, Carter was a guy who did that. He's a guy, as I said last week, who came in and said, hey, we got to change things. You know, we got to get out of this sooty kind of old school, you know, oil and gas mentality. We got to look towards the future. We got to put some solar panels, you know, and then a regressive Reagan came in and ripped him off of the White House, the solar panels, because it was trolling. That was your first owning the libs moment, right? And it was applauded on the right. And it ushered in an era of sort of Reaganism, suburban white republicanism, right? Where it was a war on the blacks. It was a war on poor, on black people, you know? It was a war on the poor. It was criminalize everybody. And cynical politicians bought into that, you know? Clinton did 1994, Clinton signed that crime bill. That was a bad move. You know, that treated 14-year-olds and tried them as adults. That, that is something that the, the African-American community in the United States is still climbing out from under. You know, that decimated inner cities. And Clinton, you know, both Bill and Hillary will be the first to tell you that that was a mistake, right? It was a political thing. You know, it was the mood of the country. And Bill Clinton was like, I need some of that. I need some of that law and order stuff to not make me feel like, you know, not, not to not let them paint me as too liberal. So he goes after S Sister Soldier, you know, and he got tied up in all that, you know, dumb stuff instead of taking the high road. And Clinton was clearly a politician capable, you know, of reaching towards our better, better angels and serving them. He's a brilliant man. I've met him many times. I'm a fan of Bill Clinton. This isn't like dissing on Bill Clinton. The point is, in that moment, he went for what was going to be politically more expedient and serve him better and didn't think about what that was going to do to the Americans that he was protected, you know, or that he was elected to protect. Predominantly, you know, African-American community. He turned his back on them, you know, because it was sort of justified as a way to survive politically. If you remember, he had just lost the House, Newt Gingrich, this whole, you know, burgeoning sort of Tea Party movement. That was like the early kind of nadir of that, maybe. And, uh, or, you know, anyway, my point is, it takes, it, it, it takes a certain kind of seasoned politician more and i'm not saying biden is completely this biden is you know biden was the guy promoting that bill in the senate <laughs> okay i'm not letting him off the hook but we have to evolve from that time right that was 30 years ago you know we have to move past that and see how those were mistakes to see how any sort of like acquiescing to reactionary forces to forces that don't treat everybody equally under the law that are going to punish people that already aren't getting a fair shake that's bad and if you're doing something like that because you think it's the only way you can appeal to a certain demographic that have been brainwashed into thinking that way that that's a good thing racism then you need to rethink your game you need to find a way to reach those people and say hey i know you want me to come in here and tell you how i'm going to lock up all the you know young black men in your community and make you feel safer, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> you know, I'm going to come into your community and tell you how we need to build schools and how you need to create opportunities for those young men. And now how we need to redress the issues that we've forced on them for hundreds of years in this country. And we're going to start that dialogue by teaching the truth in your high schools. So your children don't have to be afraid of the same things that people assumed you would be afraid of so they didn't bother to teach you right? And now you're an ignorant, middle-aged white voter with 40 guns in your house thinking somebody like Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis is looking out for your best interests. And you're not going to recognize this place <laughs> in five years if you give them another shot, right? That's the way we have to approach people, you know? We have to say, get on board because we're, we're, we're getting out of here in a way of we're getting out of this old mentality. It's not make America great again. It's save this planet, get everybody on the same page. Let's kick ass.
pitch in, you know, and make this, make this world a better place for your children and my children, metaphorically, you know? I don't have children that I know about. But anyway, uh, you know, that's what we need in politics. And, and I think Biden is interesting because he's a guy who has made mistakes, right? He did support that kind of stuff. He's still a law and order kind of dude. You know, the fact that they pin him as some like namby-pamby liberal is nothing could be further from the case. The dude is from Pittsburgh and Delaware. He is a, you know, saluting the fire chief kind of guy. Okay, but he also is matured enough as a human soul to realize there's a lot of inequality. And if we don't really address it, we don't ever make this country what it could be. We don't live up to our promises. We keep falling for cheap platitudes and huckster politicians that are only trying to fill their pockets while they increase the debt. You know, well, they drive manufacturing overseas because it's a better bottom line for their shareholders and they leave entire communities to rust with only care, the only care given to, as a place to pump in Oxycontin and make some money or, you know, bring trains through in the middle of the night that are dangerously operated, you know? Market-based management, I was mentioned last week, I couldn't remember the term. I wrote a substack on that. You know, that's a philosophy that the Koch brothers developed where they basically decided if one of these oil pipelines that they have all over the country, you know, that they got by eminent domain, by using the federal government to take land so they could make a private corporation <laughs> that moves petroleum and crude oil around even more profitable, right? Their, their, their take on that is if the, if the pipeline leaks, it's cheaper to pay the fines and deal with the cleanup from the leak than it is to shut down production and go offline and make the repairs. So these guys who crunch these numbers and say, hey, you know, we're never really gonna get in trouble for something bad and that'll be pennies on the dollar as, the, as opposed to doing the right thing, right? And, and that was accepted on both sides of the aisle, you know? the train industry, all these major industries, you know, there's a lot of money and power and they represent constituencies in a way, right? Because guys are like, hey, everybody in my, you know, in Louisiana works in the petrochemical industry. I can't just be going off on them, right? So people make compromises and then those compromises calcify into like a chokehold, a stranglehold that a lot of these businesses get over the American economy and the American way of life. And they do what they do carte blanche because they've been getting away with it. And, and I think Biden's a guy who will realize like enough's enough, you know, and Pete Buttigieg, you know, some of these younger folks, I think they're gonna go in there and, and, and change a lot of things, you know? And I think that they sense the moment, you know? I don't see just transactional politics anymore. You know, I see a, a vision and I see people recognizing a younger influx of energy that's willing to, willing to roll up their sleeves and isn't going to stand for inequality and racism and homophobia and destroying the environment and, you know, exploiting, you know, people just so you can be super rich and have a mega yacht and some kids, you know, working for pennies, right? I don't know if you saw the article in New York Times, like all the children that came to this country that are working overnight in meat packing plants, they're eating, Cheerios, they're, they're making Cheerios overnight, right? Fruit Loops and Cheerios, they have to stuff them in the boxes on these production lines, right? Like 12 year olds, people who came to this country like on their own to escape somewhere that we also had a hand in messing up, right? They come to this country to live with a relative or whatever, or whatever, and they get, you know, they're immigrant children and they get sucked into these jobs, ch child labor at a young age. That shouldn't be acceptable to us as a nation, right? Some kid is packing cornflakes or Cheerios, right? Some other kid's waking up in the morning and eating a bowl of Cheerios and getting on his school bus and getting to go be a kid and go to school. And somebody the same age is working an overnight shift in a factory, stuffing those boxes of cereal. That's wrong, that's Dickensian, right? You know, we're supposed to be past that kind of stuff. And I think the theme of this show was like, we need to start getting hip to these things that were supposedly in the rear view mirror that are now taking prominence again. Anti-Semitism, racism, all this kind of stuff that we'd never overcome, but we certainly weren't making it like a menu item right? And that's what the GOP is. They're offering it up as the dish, 
You know, child exploitation, racism, homophobia, like they're running on these platforms. And we got to stop this, you know. I feel like I've ranted enough at you. Thanks to Jane for buying a t-shirt this week. I shipped it out. I appreciate it. T-shirts at noelcastler.com. You can read my sub stack. If you like to um, support the podcast, that's a good way to do it. It's 12 bucks a month to subscribe, and it's also free. So whatever you want to do, those are my only sort of commercial things. You can find me at noelcastler.com. I appreciate you guys listening. I haven't done an episode uh in this part of the house before. So I hope it was a good one. I want to think if I have anything else to say. Nope, just love each other. Thanks. I'll see you next week. Peace.